Hello, imposters. It's me, a shape changer pretending to be Antonio D'Amico. This is Pointy Hat, and welcome to Tip of the Psych. Tricked yet again. D&D with a twist. The show where I take a D&D thing, I look at it, roll an investigation check to see if I can tell it's an illusion, fail that check, explain that thing to you, and then I give that thing a brand new twist that you can use in your own games. So when I think of mimics, I think of... Mimics are the monsters for compulsive liars and DMs that love it when players spend 20 minutes opening every chest. You know what a mimic is. A monster that can change its appearance to resemble any object, most famously a treasure chest. You know this because mimics are quite possibly the most iconic D&D monster. I don't think anyone could argue that mimics aren't the monster that has ingrained itself in popular culture the most out of all of D&D's original creations. I mean, I, I guess you can argue that if you like being wrong. Appearance-wise, Mimics are pretty well codified at least in 5th edition. They used to be grey, more similar to oozes like gelatinous cubes and black puddings and other gross guides that scoop up dirt in dungeons, but in 5th edition they are pretty uniformly portrayed as purple when out of their object form. Other big signifiers are big teeth and just a bunch of ice thrown around wherever. The whole ooze vibe is still kinda there as they use a pseudopod both to move and to attack. Any other detail about their appearance is based on whatever object they are currently taking, and they are truly can pretend to be any object. Keyword object. Mimics can transform into animals or people. The origins of Mimics as a game design concept are hotly debated by people that don't have anything better to do with their time. But from what I can tell, it's truly a D&D original. There are a couple of sources out there stating a specific year, which I'm iffy on, but specifically we have accounts of TSR employees. TSR is ancient D&D history. You don't need to learn it. For now, none live will remember it. These sources specifically state that Gygax made them up when he was mad that his players were too quick to open chests. We'll, we'll put a pin in that. Let's come back to that. It's therefore one of the few monsters in D&D that was created from a game design need first, rather than from a lore slash story starting point. So that's it on out of game mimic origins. But what about actual lore stuff? Well, say it with me, there's not much lore to these guys. Let's get into what we know. But since we're talking about a monster that turns into objects, let's quickly talk on magic objects. Magical items are a common find in adventures, and go from basic necessities to wondrous objects of legend. Adventurers often risk their lives for a chance at a powerful magical object, although they just as often find them tucked away in specialized magical item shops. But what most don't know is that these shops are often just as magical as the objects inside. These items might be ancient relics enchanted with forgotten magic from a time long past, extremely powerful and invaluable. So who exactly is this sweet old lady who has access to all of these impossibly powerful wares, and why is she so ready to part with them? I guess you can find out in Wanderer's Guide to Enchanted Emporiums, the newest source book by Eventier Games. Confession time, it takes me a ton of time to come up with magical items for my game, so this book couldn't be a more valuable resource, and I'm sure it can help you too. It has basically everything. A full system of rules, guidelines, and price lists for magic items, which thank god because 5e just has those ballpark estimates that I can't stand, and a full system to enchant and craft your own magical items, three full magical marketplaces with their own maps, 25 magic shops, five brand new subclasses, and the big number, get ready, 80 new magic items, and they are ill illustrated beautifully. So if you like magic items, whether you're a DM or player and all of this sounds interesting, the Kickstarter for Wanderer's Guide to Enchanted Emporiums is going on right now. Exciting! Check the link in the description. Okay, back to Mimics and their lore. In 2nd edition, we get the idea of Mimics as being created by wizards, which is my favorite explanation. A wizard did it. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. At least we also get an explanation that maybe said that wizards did this so that adventurers would stop opening their god chests. Which makes sense. Imagine being in a game show that had it so that if you chose the wrong door, you died. Maybe you wouldn't choose a door. A neat piece of writing comes from, of course, Dragon Magazine. Dragon Magazine is hands down my favorite D&D prehistoric thing, and the only one I care about. I find it useful even today, mostly because there's so much random small world building in it. This one specifically was written by Ed Greenwood in 1983, and it's written like a scientific overview of the monster, and it's so cute. The writing, not mimics. Those are still ugly. The article talks about the science behind their transformation, stating that they work basically like big mean octopi, changing the pigment of their skin and the texture of the skin through pumping a specific liquid through their skin. It's all very flavorful. Not the liquid, the writing. The article doesn't say if the mimic juice is tasty. Anyway, please more monster writing like this. I'm tired of reading two lines of lore and three pages of stat blocks. Another very interesting thing that this little article describes is the fact that there are different kinds of mimic, which is 
not the case in the stat block at all. It says that while many are just basically animals that will make anything that crosses their path their meal, others can actually reason and talk, learning the languages of the cultures that they infiltrate. In second edition, they could still talk, most often the language of the wizard that made them in the first place, but this is completely gone from 5e. Their stat block doesn't even have a languages section. But the whole concept of intelligent mimics is interesting to me. Let's put a pin in that. So that's honestly basically everything about Mimics. A amorphous thing that can change shape into object. Let's now take a look about how these guys fare in 5th edition. In 5th edition, Mimics are only good at lower levels, but they are very powerful in that niche. First of all, horrendous AC, but incredibly high hit points. This thing has more HP than a Rhino. Literally. The only SRD monsters that beat them are stuff like Ogre Zombies, which are just hit point bags that do nothing else other than take hits, and the Awakened Tree, which is vulnerable to one of the most common damage types in the game. I'll give you a second to try to guess what damage type that is. Uh, it's fire. It's fire. Good job. You guessed it. You must be a Pokemon master. You might think that this means that they are hit point bags, and you would be wrong. This thing not only has some of the highest hit points in all of its CR, but also packs a mean one-two punch. Basically, anything that touches the Mimic gets stuck to it. And I mean anything. This thing can stick to a huge creature and grapple it this way. Didn't notice that I didn't mention the save that you have to roll to see if you get stuck? That would be because there isn't one. If it touches you with its pseudophedes, you are stuck. Oh, I'll roll to escape at the end of my turn. Cool. You also roll those at disadvantage. And it has advantage on hitting you while you're grappled. Have fun. Yes, there's this weird stipulation that it can only do this in object form, but it's not like some other monsters that can only do some attacks in one form and not the other, so it would just stay in object form and be really annoying the whole time. So it gets all that, plus an attack that inflicts 2d8 plus 3 damage, plus acid immunity, the ability to be completely indistinguishable from an ordinary object, which means that you can see through the disguise with investigation or perception or whatever, and it also is immune to lying down. Neat. All in all, this thing is better than any dragon wormling in the same CR and like most of the CR3 creatures to be honest. It does quickly become laughable as soon as most characters can clear a DC 13 to escape the grapple, but while characters are in those lower 1 to 5 levels, mimics can be a real threat. Cool. So we've looked at the mimics appearance, their lore, their story in the game, their story out of the game, and their stat block, and that's all well and good. But what if we gave mimics a new twist? So you want to fight a mimic. What's in the box? Is it gonna kill me? Ah! Mimics are monsters that like to pretend to be an Ikea catalog because they are shy, and they murder you and your friends because you dare to open a chest in a loot-based game. That's right, it's time for me to say my opinion. I hesitate to say this because mimics are such a staple in gaming culture in general. As I said, they started in D&D, and now they're basically synonymous with RPGs, JRPGs very much included, and basically any video game genre and fiction in general. You can find mimics in Dark Souls, Castlevania, Dragon Quest, basically every Final Fantasy, and... Uh, I don't know, Beauty and the Beast? <laughs> they are popular, but are they really good for the game? Hear me out. What do Mimics accomplish exactly? Quickly. Well, let's look at why they were designed. Mimics were designed to punish a player behavior. Now, some player behaviors deserve to be punished, isn't that right? And you'll find my ruler on your wrist if you've been naughty. But is the behavior that Mimics are supposed to punish worth punishing? It is said that the reason that Mimics exist is that players went for the loot too quickly. Why is that bad? Okay, to not strawman the point, I'll say this. I understand the purpose of this if your bag is something like Tomb of Horrors. Like if your thing is dungeon crawl meat grinder where you're expected to lose like half a dozen characters to bullshit traps and carry a six foot pole around as you tap every square inch of the dungeon, I get it. I get why you would want something that punishes the act of opening a chest because you're also punishing the act of walking. But is that what most people are even playing nowadays? No, the answer is no. Most people are not playing Tomb of Horror games in the year of our Lord 2023. I have used Mimics before because I played video games before I played D&D and I have encountered like 3,000 of them in video games. But in a game, a Mimic is like one encounter out of 42 random encounters, not like one of the, I don't know, four combat encounters in a modern dungeon. And that wouldn't be such a problem if putting a Mimic in a game didn't have such far-reaching consequences down the line. Remember, Mimics are a punishment, and when you punish a behavior, the goal is for the players to change that behavior. And Mimics do this well, which might be an issue if you don't think this through. Now that you've used the Mimic, players know that loot is not safe, rewards are not safe. At the very least, this leads to them agonizing over every chest you will ever put in your game. Trauma. Trauma. PTSD. Trauma. Now, for the very funny people that love the I torture my players DM memes, I guess it's fun to see your friends struggle for 30 minutes to open a chest as they are deathly afraid that you will rock falls every one dies them for having the 
audacity to go for loot too quickly. But for well-adjusted people that want their friends to have fun when playing D&D, do you really want that? Do you really want the rest of the campaign to include 30-minute breaks of them trying their hardest not to get surprised by a mimic because they've been punished into thinking that opening a chest too quickly is bad? I don't think you do. So what are we poor gamers to do? Mimics are fun as a concept. Do we just give that up? We just don't get the element of surprise that mimics give us? The breaking of expectations? That seems like such a waste. What if there was a monster that gave us that while not feeling like a punishment? Well, if you've watched enough of this channel, you might know where I'm going with this. Hags are known to feed on suffering, although there are stories of hags that feed on other emotions, like ambitions or fear. But they are not the only fey beings that feed on emotions. Chest weasels feed on frustration. These fey beings find sustenance in annoying those around them, and they do so through their ability to possess objects and bend them to their will. A chest weasel will inhabit any object it thinks can lead to opportunities to create delectable frustration. When they are young, many of them live in cities, possessing small objects like stones in a cobblestone street that they can raise as people walk by to trip them. But as they mature, they develop a taste for more sophisticated frustration, and that's where they get their name. Chess weasels find that adventurers going through deadly dungeons have a very low tolerance for any sort of shenanigans, which means that frustration is just bubbling right below the surface, and they just need a push for it to come spewing out. They possess chests or other containers that adventurers might look into in search of treasure and make it their mission to annoy them as much as possible. Chest weasels will make their chest incorporeal or shift the position of the jar so that they may never be able to actually inspect it or make it so that the chest produces another chest when opened, feasting all the while on the adventurer's irritation. But despite what their behavior might lead you to believe, chest weasels are not inherently evil, and many understand that their source of food is not a pleasant experience for those that purvey it. If properly satiated, a chest weasel will pop out of the container and thank the adventurer that has fed it, either by giving them whatever was hidden away in the container, or by helping the adventurer in their trek through the dungeon. There are even stories of chest weasels striking deals with magic shop owners, or becoming one themselves, so that they may better cater to those they plan on feeding from later. That'd be cool, I think. As I said, I think that mimics can lead to some not-so-great learned behaviors that many dungeon masters might not have even considered when implementing them in your games. But they are a fun monster, so giving it up would be kinda sad. The reason why I think that the chest weasel works in places where the mimic doesn't is because it turns it from a deadly combat encounter into a comedic one that is basically a puzzle. It's also just really fun to track frustration on your players as a way of solving a puzzle. Either they somehow catch the weasel, in which case it will give out his loot in exchange for its life, or they'll feed it enough so that it feels compelled to just hand it to them. The solution to the puzzle is people swearing out loud. There is literally no negative outcome to this encounter, and you'll still get that sense of surprise at a chest not being what it seems. But old veterans of the game also get that sense of surprise, because old veterans know what a mimic is, but they have more than likely never encountered a chest weasel. So yeah, I guess it's up to you to just come up with a bunch of chest weasel encounters. Ways in which they can use their objects to frustrate adventurers, possible objects that they can possess. Oh, and of course a stat block in case you have some martyr hobos that can take a joke and go instantly for the kill. Oh, what's that? Oh, oh, one second. Come here, come here, go on, get, come here. You, aha, got it. Oh, would you look at that? This chest contained a full stat block of the chest weasel illustrated and designed by me. Who could have ever seen that coming? That's right, the chest weasel is ready for you to use in the description of this very video for... 100% certified free. So go out there, take some medicine for your blood pressure, think some happy thoughts, and grab that weasel. And... We're done. That's Mimics, baby. A shorter video for me. How unexpected, but in theme for the video. To be honest, I really, really like the concept of the chest weasel, and judging by the comments on my Feywild adventure, so did most of you, which was very surprising. And since the little twerp never got a stat block, I felt like it deserved to be in the spotlight for its own little video. Look at him go! And speaking of surprising receptions to my content, my stream is going insanely well! Welcome to... Today's beautiful and magical and incredible stream! We are affiliates now, in less than two weeks after starting! And we are well on our way for partnership if we felt like it. I don't know if I'll do that. It's insane. Once again, I don't know how to say how thankful I am for the reception for the stuff I do. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, I'm doing world building live on stream and we are creating this entire D&D campaign world together with the audience and the audience gets a say on what happens and what we decide. We've created like the baseline rules of the world, we're working on different lineages, the new word for races, and regions. And 
and we're getting into God's next stream, which is this Sunday at 5 p.m. EST, 2 p.m. PDT, 10 p.m. GMT plus one. And if you want to catch up, I recap what we did last time at the beginning of the stream, or you can watch the VOD that is on the Twitch channel. That's just their fancy name for video. So you can just watch the stream if you feel like catching up that way. Last time we created moth people and candle robots. So if that sounds exciting, go watch it if you feel like it. We certainly have a ton of fun in chat. There's already memes developing, which is great and also scary. So I hope to see you there. Be careful of chests. It's, it's very hard to give IRL advice on mimics. Be careful of mimes. Okay, enough outro. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Gotta go. Gotta prep for stream. See you there Sunday, please. Okay, maybe not. You do whatever you want to do. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mwah.